All right, so tonight I'm going to be talking to you about the Great Reset. So unfortunately, the devil, he did attack our previous video and we lost it actually. And a lot of problems happened, which is very strange and weird. This never happened. And when we were live streaming, we never had this many people before, but there were over 800 people watching just live. So that was very huge. So because of all this, I'm very convinced that I should teach this again and then hopefully the devil won't attack and ruin this video. So it shows that this is a very crucial, important video. Now everyone has heard about the Great Reset obviously, but I'm going to show you some interesting things about the Great Reset on how it matches to a T with Daniel chapter 11. So how we know about the Great Reset is based upon the Fourth Industrial Revolution. You might say, what in the world does that mean? So basically the Fourth Industrial Revolution, they boast in being the fourth kind above the third, the second, and the first Industrial Revolution, which is basically an era of greater advancement of civilization and technology. So the fourth industrial revolution, what that is, is it's such a great advancement of technology and civilization that it's going to be an advancement of where it interconnects with biology now. So where all of our human systems and functions about ourselves, human biology is now going to be intermingled with technology. That's the fourth industrial revolution. Now this sounds like a sci-fi show, but this is actually very, very true. And this is from uh, the article from the World Economic Forum. It's titled, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, What It Means, How to Respond. And then the person who's greatly advancing this or in charge of it is Klaus Schwab. And Klaus Schwab, he mentions this about the fourth industrial revolution, which kind of uh, gets sticks up your hair and makes you very nervous and concerned about where we're heading toward. He says here, already artificial intelligence is all around us. From self-driving cars and drones to virtual assistants and software that translate or invest, impressive progress has been made in AI in recent years, driven by exponential increases in computing power and by the availability of vast amounts of data from software used to discover new drugs to algorithms used to predict our cultural interests, digital fabrication technologies, meanwhile, are interacting with the biological world on a daily basis. Did you hear that? Let me repeat that again. Digital fabrication technologies, meanwhile, are interacting with the biological world on a daily basis. Engineers, designers, and architects are combining computational design, additive manufacturing, materials engineering, and synthetic biology. So listen to this part. All this technological stuff with synthetic biology, something that's biological combined, it says all these will pioneer a symbiosis between microorganisms, our bodies, the products we consume, and even the buildings we inhabit. Wow, so it shows right here that, that our biological systems itself, there's going to be somehow uh, where there's an interaction and a meeting with the technological world. So this may not be as sci-fi as you think. Uh, it continues reading here, which is very, very crazy, but it is very, very true. This was disturbing. We need to shape a future that works for all of us by putting people first and empowering them. In its most pessimistic, dehumanized form, dehumanized form, as if you're not human anymore. The fourth industrial revolution may indeed have the potential to robotize humanity. They say robotize, make you a robot. So humanity at its most pessimistic form where it's heading toward can become robotic. That's scary. And that's the most negative viewpoint. But it becomes more disturbing when it says, and thus to deprive us of our heart and soul. It's as if it's robbing your very own soul, as if you're not real, the real you anymore. That's disturbing. 
But as a complement to the best parts of human nature, creativity, empathy, stewardship, it can also lift humanity into a new collective and moral consciousness based on a shared sense of destiny. So it's pointing out right here that in the positive sense, which is still very disturbing if you know your Bible about what the Antichrist will do when he sets up his one world government, they say the most positive form is that we're going to advance into a more, what they call a collective, see that's one world, and moral consciousness based on a shared sense of destiny. So it's uh, the most positive sense and form they're saying is going to be a one worldness, one world. Civilization, one world technology, one world advancement. So that's the most positive that they say. Whereas the most pessimistic, it's going to dehumanize you, you're robbed of your soul, and it's gone. Why, if you know your Bible, the Antichrist, he comes in with terms of peace. One world, let's conquer everything together. But then, if you know your Bible, in the end it turns into a dehumanized form, a demonic form, a soulless form, whereas people's souls have been robbed and there's destruction all over. Wow. I mean, this is the kind of world that they're pushing, the globalists. So, the globalists are pushing a kind of world that's already fulfilling Bible prophecy. It's fulfilling Bible prophecy. So let's see Daniel chapter 11. And you'd be shocked right here that Daniel chapter 11 matches to a T with the World Economic Forum on what they predicted is going to happen. So this is their video. And you can find it on Facebook. If you go to their Facebook page, the World Economic Forum, they have a video called Eight Predictions for the World in 2009. Uh, 2030, excuse me, 2030, not 2009. So, eight predictions for the world in 2030. Now, number one is probably what you've heard of before, which it got a lot of backlash. It's basically, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. So, they say that basically, no one's going to have private property. So, private property, what you own personally to yourself is going to be gone and you'll be happy. Now, if you keep looking to, uh, onwards, they'll mention right here why. Why is it that you'll own nothing and you'll be happy? Maybe they don't, let's be fair to them, they probably don't mean it in a way that you won't have a place or a living resident for yourself. But what they're pointing out right here is that basically there's going to be these drones. So they say this in number one, drones will deliver stuff and items to your door. So basically, you don't have to get out. You don't have to take responsibility and action for yourself. You can become dependent on these machines, see the fourth industrial revolution, to take care of your needs. They said they're going to have drones deliver stuff to your doorstep. That's what they said right here, the World Economic Forum, for number one prediction. Why, that's insane right here. Uh, look at uh, Matthew, uh, not Matthew, Daniel chapter 11, Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. They said, whatever you want, you'll rent, and it'll be delivered by drone. So that's what they say for number one. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. And if we know the Antichrist, his goal is that private property or stuff that you own more for yourself will be gone, and that he wants you to be dependent on this guy here to take care of your needs, because this guy here is going to rely on this guy for their advancement of their technology to provide for your needs. Look at Daniel chapter 11. Now look, this is amazing. Daniel 11 will fit out with all these eight predictions that the World Economic Forum mentioned. I'm going to show you that. It's amazing how the scriptures will unfold to you. If you look at Daniel chapter 11, we know that the Antichrist is mentioned at verse 21. Verse 21. The Bible says, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So this is the Antichrist. He comes in peaceably, takes over the one world kingdom through flatteries. Now notice right here what he says. 
What is he going to do at verse 24? He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province. Look at that. He's conquering property and land for himself. Why? It's the Antichrist's job that you have nothing for yourself. That's what the globalists are preparing a way for for the Antichrist and they want to join along with that one. They want to take more territory, control for themselves. The Antichrist wants that for himself. Whereas the common people, they lose more control, uh, more responsibility for themselves and they become dependent and give their property, their belongings to, their lands to, the Antichrist or to this guy over here. And we already seen that going on throughout history with communism, how much they control everything. You see that with the current boo-boo over here. The current boo-boo over here wants to increase this for your stay and where you live and etc. Now, look at this. It predicts again about and he shall do that which his fathers have not done. So we're in verse 24. Continue reading. Nor his father fathers. Now look at this. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. Why? Remember? Uh, they mention you own nothing and you'll be happy. That matches with Daniel 11. He's going to enter the fattest provinces for himself. And then they mention that whatever you want, you'll rent and it'll be delivered by drone. And that verse continues, the Antichrist, what? He's going to scatter the riches, the spoils, and give it to the people. Kind of like communism, how they want to say, let's uh, scatter and give the stuff to the people here. See, the Antichrist is to prepare a socialist, communist type of setup. There is no doubt about that. Now, the next one, number two, which is disturbing from the World Economic Forum, is... They mentioned the U.S. won't be the world's leading superpower. A handful of countries will dominate. Wow. So then, in other words, U.S. won't be the leader anymore. But there's a few small number of these countries who are going to control and be in power. Have you ever read the book of Daniel 11 and the Antichrist? What his setup is going to be, he's going to have a small band of elite and people in power who's going to control everything. See, that's what the globalists, that's what the Antichrist wants to set up at the end. Now, let's look at Daniel chapter 11. Notice what the Bible reads at verse 23, 23, what the Antichrist will do. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. For he shall come up and shall become strong with a what? Small people. So see, there's going to be that handful number that's going to be in power and be the leading superpower and control the world. Wow, scripture fulfilled. Number three, it says that you won't die waiting for an organ donor. What's going to happen is that they will print you new ones. They're not going to transplant organs. They're going to print new ones instead. You might say, really, there's such a thing. Yeah, you can look it up yourself. But there are these three, what they call these 3D printers for organs. And what they do is that they design and they create, so to speak, new organs for you. Wow, it's amazing. Such technology can predict, can foreknow about certain biological symptoms and the human anatomy that they can make this new creation for you? Is that such a thing possible? Yes, it's predicted in the Bible. That's what the Antichrist will do. He'll produce such technology, such devices that can foreknow, predict, forecast. Look at the wording right here. The Bible shows in Daniel chapter 11. Keep reading verse, the last part of verse 24. I didn't read it. Yea, and he shall, what? Forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. How about that? So then the Antichrist will have his own devices that can forecast, that can predict. That's crazy. So uh, why would the Antichrist love that kind of technology? What if in the future 
The Antichrist just wants to rob more that's what's humane in you and replace something that's more robotic. Remember what the fourth industrial revolution warned about? The most pessimistic type of form that it can end up in is that it'll rob your heart and soul and you'll become more of a robot. But that's what the Antichrist is going to do. He doesn't want you to remain human. He wants you to remain demonically controlled, all owned by him in the future. That's what he wants at the end. Uh, number four, this is crazy. They said, you'll eat much less meat. Why? It's going to be an occasional treat, not a staple. Why? It's for the good of the environment and our health. That's the idea. So... That's crazy that the fourth prediction is you won't eat as much meat anymore. It's going to be only like a treat. It's only going to be once in a while. Why? To preserve, to protect the environment. But uh, hey, if you re read your Bible at the book of Revelation, the environment still crashes. It will not survive. It will not succeed, no matter how much mankind might boast about that. And the Bible showed you, believe it or not, in Daniel chapter 11... What the Antichrist wants is, see, he wants all the goods for himself. And then he's the one in control of the meat. And he'll be the one to decide for the people uh, which amount of meat they can eat. I mean, that's what they said right here is that uh, meat is not going to be something that you can occasionally eat. It's just going to be a treat. How are you going to do that unless you put some regulation, rule or control? See, it's paving a way to something what the Antichrist will do. Look at Daniel chapter 11. Look at how crazy your Bible is, but that's how amazing your, your Word of God is. Look at Daniel chapter 11. Notice that the Bible reads concerning about uh, the meats where uh, the Antichrist, he has some uh, form uh, of control, which is very strange at verse 26. Yea, they that feed... Of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. Now look at that right here. So it's going to become destruction to these people who feed on the Antichrist meat. How about that? Your Bible something else. Number four, uh, number five, excuse me. A billion people will be displaced by climate change. We'll have to do a better job at welcoming and integrating refugees. Now, notice right here that, see, they keep using this excuse about climate change, climate change, climate change. Why is it that they would love to keep talking about this? Because they want to point out right over here that with climate change, people will dis be displaced and they're going to have to move into which parts? The big cities where it's already crowded, where there's over overpopulation. Why would you want these people to move out of these territories and then make these big cities, which were already overpopulated, welcome all these refugees who got displaced by climate change? Why would you want to do that? Maybe they don't want to, they might say. But the thing is here, when you look at the Antichrist and then his agenda, with his elitists in power, this is what they would like. What they would like is, they would like more of the world and land to control for themselves because they're greedy. But then the common people, you stuff them all away. And right now, the common people are already deceived. They say, oh, you know, uh, I love to live in a city. I love my apartment. I love my condo. And they like it when these buildings are stacked on top of each other. They don't like these big lands and properties. But then you hear wealthy people like Bill Gates who becomes the, the number one person who bought the most farmland. Now, why would a, a billionaire like that, who's in charge of Microsoft, be interested in something like that, I wonder? Look at Daniel 11. The Antichrist and his people would want something like that. And then they're going to use that kind of excuse with climate change or maybe some other excuse to accomplish that. Let's look at Daniel chapter 11. Notice what the Antichrist will do. If you read Daniel chapter 11 and verse 39, 39. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with the strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause him to rule over many, 
and shall what? Divide the land for gain. How about that? So notice right here, the Antichrist, he wants to take land for himself and then he wants to divide it off. Why? Because all these people are being displaced and moving into different divisions and territories where you're going to have to welcome them in. And notice in that passage, it says that he's going to have them rule over many. Who is these small group of people ruling over many? Right here, the, think about the 10 kings that the Antichrist will have, right? He has his 10 elitists, his 10 kings in power, world powers controlling. That's why he's going to have them divide and rule over. All right, let's look at another, port, uh, another part right here. It's uh, number six. Polluters will have to pay to emit carbon dioxide. There will be a global price on carbon. This will help make fossil fuels history. So notice that they put a taxation. Why? Because they like to tie it to climate change and then global warming and etc. with uh, carbon emission up in the air. So let's put a taxation, a global taxation on that. Well, uh, what's wrong with that one? Well, then it shows a world, one world, they say global right here. See that? Like the globalists. They want to put a one world taxation control. And that is how those people become more powerful. The Antichrist leaders become more powerful. Because they're going to tax the whole world and control them. Notice the Antichrist does that. That's his goal. Look at Daniel chapter 11 again. Scripture just matches up to a T. Verse 20. Verse 20. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within few days he shall be destroyed neither in anger uh, nor in battle. Now, this part of the scripture was fulfilled with Caesar Augustus. If you study his history as well, he taxed the whole world. Jesus Christ was born that time during the time when he taxed the whole world. And then his death was actually very mysterious. It was just sudden. So he fulfilled that passage. But notice who fills up in his place, in his position of taxing the world. The next part is the Antichrist. The verse says, and in his estate. See that? He took over the estate of Caesar Augustus, who's a Roman power, by the way, right? So a Roman power. So Rome's the one in power here. And they're the ones in charge of this taxation. Who follows along that? Another, the Antichrist, we read that before. In his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. How about that? The Antichrist fills in that Roman position, his estate of taxing the whole world. And look at Revelation 18. This is crazy. Look at the wording right here with Revelation chapter 18. So they want to put a taxation concerning about carbon emission and then that could tie to gas or oil and etc. Look what the Bible says. Rome is the one who taxes the whole world, who makes riches off of it. So some way or another, keep your eye on the Vatican and they're going to somehow take charge within this. Perhaps they already are. Because there are people who research and then they find certain people in power who control all the money. And they'll say it's certain bankers. When they go to certain bankers and they find out it's certain globalists. Then when they, some people who dig even deeper, they'll claim it's Rothschild. But then other people who dig be more deep, then they find out that the Knights of Malta, which is a Catholic organization, that they're the ones who are owning a lot of the banks, including the Swiss banks. And when you total all the banks tied to the Knights of Malta, it totals more than the Rothschilds. And by the way, Rothschild, he's given the title and the name as guardian of the Vatican's treasury. So it shows right here that it's fulfilling scripture all about Roman power. Look at Revelation 18. Revelation chapter 18. Notice that the Bible reads here, in verse 11, And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. 
the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thigh and wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all ma manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble, etc., etc., etc. Verse 15, the merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off. So notice right here, Rome is the one who receives all the money and the wealth from the world. But look at something else that she owns here, which is interesting. If she gets the money from the world, money on this one too, verse 13, and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and what? Oil. Look at that. Remember, what, what is, did the World Economic Forum say? They mention right here a global tax on carbon. And what did the Bible say about the Antichrist when he's tied with Rome? If you look at Revelation 17, it continues that same topic about the whore of Revelation, who is undoubtedly Rome. And then you'll find out in Revelation 17, the Antichrist is tied to this beast. The woman, which is Rome, Babylon, the whore of Revelation, she's tied to that beast. And that beast is, Revelation 13, the Antichrist. So the Antichrist is tied to Roman power, gets the wealth, and then owns the oil. Wow, it just matches so much. Scripture shows how much everything lines up really interestingly. Now, number seven, you could be preparing to go to Mars. Scientists will have worked out how to keep you healthy in space. The start of a journey to find alien life? <laughs> That's pretty crazy. What you thought was sci-fi? Now it beco it's becoming more and more of a reality. They, they are going to try to encounter aliens. Now look at Isaiah 14 and Daniel 11 again. Look at how Daniel 11 just shows all of this. Look at Daniel 11 again. Now alien shows that it's a strange. Alien means stranger, foreign, something that's not normal. Look at Daniel chapter 11. Notice that the Antichrist is going to give them an alien God or a strange God. The Bible reads here at verse 37, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of woman, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces and a God whom his fathers knew not. Look at verse 39. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with the what? Strange God. So what's an alien? Something that's so foreign, out of bounds, never heard of before. And that's what the Antichrist is going to bring. This kind of alien God. Something abnormal, out of bounds before. Something the fathers knew not, the verse points out. Now it is interesting that when you have seen these movies in Star Wars, they talk about this spiritual entity behind it that's in outer space. And they call this alien thing, entity in outer space, the force. That's why they say, may the force be with you. Why? The Antichrist, when he pushes this alien god, it's also known as the force. Look at right here. Notice verse 38. But in his estate shall he honor the god of what? Forces. Man, that's so crazy how the scripture shows all of this. But let me show you another one. Look at the last verses of Daniel 11. Look at verse 44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Huh. So the Antichrist, he hears something coming from the north. Going all the way up. That disturbs him. East, but as well as north. So then he gets disturbed by that. That's why he rallies up his armies. Notice, therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Notice in this verse it shows the Antichrist tries to rally up an army and he goes to the glorious mountain. So that's Israel. And then he tries to fight out against what he's troubled, something coming from the east as well as the north. Why, you know who comes. It's God Almighty out from outer space. And he comes down with his people and then conquers uh, the Antichrist and wipes them all out. Him and his government and his kingdom. So, notice that the Antichrist and his people are prepared for an alien encounter. Someone from outer space. That's what the north is. The devil knows what's up north. Look at Isaiah 14. 
Isaiah 14. What's coming from the north? What is the north? If you don't know, the devil knows. Isaiah 14. Keep your hand at Daniel 11 because we're going to come back here because we have to match up all of Daniel 11 with the other predictions. Look at Isaiah 14 and then verse 12. The Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down? How art thou cut down to the ground which this weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the what? Stars of God. So this is outer space right here. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. See that? That's what north is. It's definitely referring to outer space. So, see, if the scientists are already teaching this to you, what are they doing right here? What they're doing right here is that they're conditioning you. They're conditioning you that, hey, don't be shocked. This is going to be something that we've already been prepared and uh, we've already told you for a long time. And then if people watch too many Hollywood movies about, oh yeah, there's going to be these aliens that are going to come from outer space and we have to fight these bad aliens, but here we got these good aliens. What? The Antichrist with his alien god. Thor! Right? Here are these aliens, these weird people out of, who aren't human. They're the good guys and we're going to fight against this other alien coming out from the north. This is Thanos and this is his bad dudes right there. You notice, see, Hollywood is putting that mysterious conditioning and message upon them where it brainwashes them. That's pretty disturbing. So then the people, they're not going to be shocked when God comes down out of heaven. The Antichrist already rallies up his people because they've already been brainwashed by Hollywood. That's disturbing. Now here's uh, number eight. Western values will have been tested to the breaking point. Checks and balances that underpin our democracies must not be forgotten. Okay, so what are they saying right here? What they're saying right here is that Western values, it's going to be demolished and gone. But then the things that uh, created our democracy, we should not forget about it. Now that's very hypocritical and that's so subtle that it deceived you people that you didn't catch that. What does that mean? Western values, if you uh, think about it, they tie it, they attribute it to Christianity back then. America, how it was founded, was based upon so-called Western values, but it was Christianity. So then with this knowledge, that's how we got our democracy. But then this wicked world wants to brainwash you by saying, let's not forget our democracy, but Western values should be gone. Why, you idiots, the Western values is what build up the democracy. You notice that? This, they blinded, they deceived you, they tricked you. In, with this eighth point. So then, they're saying, let's not forget about being a democracy. What made us a democracy? But those Western values, they're going to be bad, and they're going to be gone. They're going to be diminished. You notice that? They're contradicting themselves. The Western value was what built up the democracy. So that's why you get these people like Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, and these guys, who are not, say, people. However, they do sympathize a lot with us Christians. Why? Because Christian thinking is logical thinking. And then Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, they see that logical thinking. And they see the value of that, uh, what they call westernization, the liberals will call it. Like one plus one equals two. You know what the liberals call that? That's a western white man's Eurocentric ideology. It, sh it doesn't equal two. If you look at a cultural context, it can mean something else. See, so they lack understanding. Greek, uh, the Greek civilization, how it was born and given birth to rationalization and logical thinking and reason, philosophy, etc. That's where a lot of the Western values and a lot of Western ideology, education, higher education, was formed through all of that. But then the wicked world, they... They drop that understanding and dumbing you down more with what? Cultural context. LGBTQ, X, Y, and Z, etc. And then they reinterpret it. They get rid of understanding, even common sense reason. And Daniel 11 predicted there will be people like that. That's why you got people all over online who call themselves truthers or woke. 
Why? Because they see uh, uh, so-called what they... Now, number eight, they call this Western values, but me, I see this more as understanding, okay? It's more of understanding. They have an understanding, and they see that. But then to the liberal mindset and to the globalists, they call this Western. They like to term it that way. That way you can feel troubled by it and be more inclusive. That's their tactic. But look at Daniel chapter 11. The Bible predicted that this would happen with the Antichrist. There's going to be people who have understanding. Look at verse uh, 33. And they that understand among the people. See that? shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be whole pen with a little help, but many shall cleave to them uh, with flatteries, and some of them of understanding shall fall, to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. So notice that this passage talks about uh, people who have understanding, and the Antichrist in the world is going to try to deceive them, brainwash them, which they're doing right now, people who have understanding. And that's the reason why people who have this uh, truth and this woke or this understanding and their eyes are being opened, there's a good num number of them that are becoming saved Christians. So God sees that, that they, they can become saved saints. So that's why he says in the tribulation that there's going to be a good number of them who have understanding that will become saved saints and they're going to be persecuted. They're going to be harassed. They're going to be oppressed. Oh, excuse me, you're seeing already, uh, you're already seeing that right now. But in the tribulation, it's going to be way more intense when the Antichrist sets it up. What are they doing? They're conditioning. They're setting things up. It's a game. They're setting things up one by one. Okay, so notice how all of this matches up with Daniel 11 and how Scripture is fulfilled. Now, look at, here are the famous big names of globalists that you're going to hear about. And these famous big names of globalists, they realize this about the Great Reset and the Great Reset, what is that? I told you it's based off the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Basically, the idea is this. Because the economy is falling apart through all the uh, current situations that we're going through, the world's falling apart, we, it's kind of like a reset button. We want to start everything afresh and bring something brand new again. Now, for some of you who don't know, there's another thinking that shares that ideology. It's a demonic thinking of the occultists. And what you hear about uh, certain uh, wicked satanic globalism. And what they teach is destruction is necessary so that we can bring in a better technology, civilization, better kingdom. Well, I notice how all of this is just matching with what you're hearing with the big guys talking about this. Great reset, great reset. Let's see, let me be nice to them. Let me give them the benefit of the doubt, all right? They probably didn't even mean to. If they didn't even mean to, that makes it even way worse. You might say, why is that? Because then it shows that if it's not something that's of themselves, then there's a spirit behind that that's controlling all of this. That's really scary. All right, now let me uh, give you some quotes right here that's going to shock you. So one of them is by uh, CNBC. Title of the article, White House Health Advisor Fauci says we may never get back to normal after coronavirus pandemic. How about that? See, uh, why? Reset. It's, they're trying to condition, teach the people to open up to this. And here's another one. This is by uh, George Soros. George Soros, title of the article right here, uh, is from Market Watch. George Soros, I do not think anybody knows how capitalism will evolve amid the coronavirus pandemic. So that's the title of the article. And notice what he says here, which is uh, pretty disturbing. We will not, so they want you to get rid of what is normal right now. They want you to forget that. They want the destructive forces to be the, uh, to, they want you to think that the destruction wipes everything out of what you know is normal and let's open up to something new. Soros, we will not go back to where we were when the pandemic started. That is pretty certain. That's what he says. 
He also says right here, at the present time, people are dominated by fear. And fear very often makes people hurt themselves. That is true of individuals as well as institutions, nations, and humanity itself. Wow, how about that? So he points out right here that uh, the, the current crisis that we're going through has changed everything and that we are not going to return to normal. And he also mentioned right here that uh, fear, it's going to bring everybody together again. Because the guy asked him, could this crisis, you know, the destruction, bring people and nation states closer together? Meaning one world, right? Soros says, yes. Why? Because people are dominated by fear. It is the devil's job to put fear into the hearts of people to create this one world thing so that people can become dependent on certain systems to control their lives, to take care of them. That's scary. But the Bible says God hath not given us the spirit of what? Fear. That's not... That's not of God. That's of the devil. Here's another one. So Biden, uh, he understands this too. So then that's why uh, he calls it Build Back Better. So he calls it Build Back Better. B, B, B. Kind of like 666. But anyway, I, dig I digress, you know. It's just uh, crazy thinking, of course. Here's a title from the article from The Hill. John Kerry reveals Biden's devotion to radical Great Reset movement. See that? They're all in this together. The big names here. They're all in this together. They all agree in this. Kerry said, and yes, it, which is the Great Reset, will happen. And I think it will happen with, this is scary, I think it will happen with greater speed and with greater intensity than a lot of people might imagine. In effect, the citizens of the United States have just done a great reset. We've done a great reset. Wow, how about that? So it might come even faster then. This might go even way faster than you thought. Here's another one. The guy, who, uh, Klaus Schwab, if I remembered his name correctly, the one who's I mentioned about the Fourth Industrial Revolution, who was a leading person for the World Economic Forum that discussed about the Great Reset. So that's where it came from. It's all from the World Economic Forum. That's how he started the articles. He says this, from the Financial Review, title of the article, when will things get back to normal? Never, says Dav uh, Davos founder. So Klaus Schwab and Davos founder, they say, uh, the people here say, it's not going to go back to normal. See, they want, they, why they, they're conditioning the people, they're teaching the people. The destructionary forces gets rid of the current normalcy and everything. We got to think about the new one. Remember the occultists? What do they, what do they prophesy? What do they want? Destruction is necessary to wipe away the current normal government system so that we can pave a way for a new one. How about that? This is all sharing a satanic mindset right here. Now, Bill Gates, uh, everyone knows that big name. They tie him to a lot of the stuff concerning about globalism. Title of the article from The Hill is Bill Gates, who predicted the pandemic, names the next two monster disasters that could shake our world. Why? It's going to keep on going then. This is not the last. The current crisis. It's going to get worse then. It's going to get worse. He says this, Gates. This is scary. Now, think about this. There are people who are concerned about, well, what if the globalists are the ones who released everything with what's going on in our current crisis situation? Hmm. If that's a concern... I wonder if it becomes even more concerning when a leading globalist figure boldly tells the people and conditions them that, hey, guess what? There are people who are going to deliberately release, deliberately release the disease and spread the, a greater crisis among the population. What if you condition the people that way? That way it can like kind of give permission for evil people to do their thing then. 
That'd be scary, right? Well, Bill Gates, he says here, also related to pandemics is something people don't like to talk about much, which is bioterrorism. So Bill Gates says this will happen. That somebody who wants to cause damage could engineer a virus. This, this, is, this is a really bold thing to say now. Notice that they're getting even more bold now. You notice that? They're getting bolder. Like they're not concerned about dumb brainwashed people, what they might think. So that means the chance of running into this is more than just the naturally caused epidemics like the current one. What? Let me read that again, okay? Somebody who wants to cause damage could engineer a virus. So that means the chance of running into this is more than just the naturally caused epidemics like the current one. Whoa, that should scare you. But it should scare you when in The Entrepreneur, the title of the article is Bill Gates warns that a next, next pandemic could be 10 times worse. Isn't that, uh, did you read Revelation chapter 6? What is the Antichrist going to do? The Antichrist, what he's going to do is comes with these terms of peace to brainwash the people and that the people can dumb down and don't pay attention, don't see it. And then the Antichrist and Satan is going to, they're going to unleash their demonic forces among their own populace. And then it's, guess what? Those things is way, way worse. The seven seals of Revelation releasing demonic hordes, that's going to be way, way worse. Like 10 times worse, so to speak, than the current crisis you're going through. What in the world? What is the devil, what does the devil want people to do? To be conditioned. So that when these things happen, people will be so blind and stupid that they won't say, oh, Revelation, the Bible prophesied about this. Maybe I should get saved. No, they're going to say, oh, no, we already knew about this all along. And, you know, this is uh, something that should be expected. It's okay. And let's go through it together. And that's why Revelation 16 shows you, which is scary, that when worse crises happen upon the world, that the Bible shows that people still refuse to repent. That's scary. The only way you can do that, though, is you condition the people. You brainwash them. See, this is all demonic influence. This is all a demonic setup. Now, this is from uh, the big boy right here, which some people believe would be in charge of everything of the globalists, uh, globalism, conspiracy, and the top of the food chain of the elites and evil, if you, they believe it is the Jesuits and then the Jesuit leader or Jesuit general, let's see what he has to say, huh? This is from uh, Arturo Sosa. The title, of his, uh, the title of this interview is The Preferences in a Time of Uncertainty and COVID-19. So you know what he said? Okay, look, look how, I mean, look at all these Freudian slips, so to speak. Really? Don't forget that this also is not an accident. What? He's talking about the current crisis that people were panicking about. He says, don't forget that this is also not an accident. It is not an accident, the, I'll just say blank, okay? Uh, for filter's sake, okay? You know what I mean, all right? YouTube knows what I mean, right? Okay. So filter's sake, uh, there, there's not a lot of safe language, so to speak. Not a lot of freedom. It is not an accident, the blank. It is the fruit of a way. Rather, how all human beings will understand to create our one relationship with each other. See this one world mindset? And it is a confirmation of our mission, the Jesuits, their mission to collaborate, to contribute in the change of this world. See, they're, they're all ushering this one world thing. And he says right here, and how we need to truly get together so we can go in another way. And don't think, he says this, don't think as if after the crisis, Things are going to change. There are very many who are interested in this idea. And so many of us are so used to the way of the past. We are dreaming to come back to our individual normality 
We are dreaming to just live as we were before the, before the beep came to our life. But that is the great temptation. So to take an opportunity of this crisis is to be aware that something must have to change. How about that? So he pointed out right over here, there are people who have this fantastical dreaming of, let's go back to the things that are normal, the current situation. But he's trying to tell you, no, because of the destructionary forces, you can't go back. You have to go to what is new. Remember when I told you about that occultist theosophical society? What did they say? You, uh, we need to usher this one world new, uh, new kingdom that is demonic. In order to do that, there has to be destruction. You have to get rid of the old regime. Notice how they're already inserting this stuff into the people's minds. He says, so don't forget this crisis. Not, yes, okay, that was a bad night or nightmare, and now we are awake again, and we are in our life as before again. Nope, nope, we have to understand the lesson that if we, if we don't change after this, the next one will be worse. Look at all these uh, big names for the, pushing the one world agenda have in common. They all know. They all agree on something. And they're all conditioning the people. Brainwash. How about that? How about that? Now, what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says, uh, if you look at Revelation, uh, we won't turn there, but uh, I want you to turn to a different passage. All right? Go to Genesis 1, Genesis 1, and then G Jeremiah, uh, Genesis 9. We're going to look at Genesis 1, and then I want you to go to Genesis 9. And then I want you to go to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. Now, we're not going to turn to this passage, as I mentioned before, which is going to be Revelation 13. In Revelation 13, it told you that the Antichrist, uh, he's going to have an image that has life and can speak. Why, today, you get images that have life as if they're living and they speak to you. Your cell phone, the internet, the TV, uh, fourth industrial revolution, AI, stuff like that. How about that? And the Bible shows that this thing is going to track people and, uh, if, and it's going to, uh, no, 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 that this image right here, that it's going to make sure that people will die. They're going to be killed and executed if they don't follow the Antichrist system. Well, it makes you more disturbed when you hear about AI and technology that they're building up in a way where it can track down people. And what if, what if you have something that tracks down people and uh, to find out which ones are a threat to our society, that endanger the health and the welfare of our society so that they can target them and then track them down. And then later on in the future, the Antichrist already has that system built. And then he uses that system to what? Kill. To kill the people who won't follow along his regime. That's disturbing, right? Well, we're going to look now at the book of Genesis chapter 1. And then we're going to look at verse 28. Genesis 1, 28. Now God, what he does is that he doesn't like... Uh, he doesn't use that word reset in his Bible. You might say, why? Well, it's like Revelation 13 pointed out. Something robotic, technological, that the Antichrist would like, right? So, because reset sounds like something technological and robotic, like pressing a reset button, right? So then God, he doesn't have that word in his Bible, but he has a different word. He calls it replenish. He calls it the great, so I would like to call it the great replenish. His word would call it replenish. It doesn't say reset, it says replenish. But Satan, he's uh, of that technological mindset. Why? Because the Bible says he is the prince of the power of the air. 
See, it connects something technological. The Bible also says that I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. See, he's connected to electricity, technological. So Satan likes that. But God says, no, this is going to be natural. This is going to be something from my power and something that's human, not technological combined with human. This is going to be something purely natural from human, but by my own power. And that's replenishing. God created man. That's his power. And something natural, man reproduces through themselves. Look at Genesis chapter 1 and then verse 28. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and what? Replenish the earth. All right, I want you to go to Genesis 9 now. Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. Now, notice that God said this the second time, and the second time he said this was to Noah. He told Noah about this. Now, let me uh, write something down over here quickly. So, the first time, I didn't really explain that, replenish. He created man, right? So, this was Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve replenished the earth... Why? Because something was broken down before. What is it? Lucifer and his kingdom. So for some of you who don't know about that, you can watch my video called uh, The Gap Theory. The Gap Theory. But Lucifer and his minions, they were ruling over the world before. And that's why God told Adam and Eve not to fill the earth, but to what? Replenish the earth. He called it replenish. Why? To fill it again. Fill it again, because there were demonic beings before, and then God says to replenish. Oh, no wonder the devil, he wants to wipe out mankind, and then put something else again. And then you got people calling the Great Reset, they say. <coughs> There's, you're seeing Satan's plan, system, and tactic, right? Unfolding right before your eyes. Why? Because he's been treated something like that before by God. So he wants to get back at God. Second time was to Noah and to his people. The reason why Noah and then his sons were told to replenish the earth is because of what happened at Genesis 6. Those sons of God, Satan tries to come down again. And then he builds up. It's amazing. You read Genesis 5, 6 and not only that, a lot of ancient accounts and you can pick them up in India and other places as well where they talk about that during this timeline there were gods living amongst humans and that before there was this worldwide catastrophe or other accounts will call it the flood the Bible calls it Noah's flood they said that these gods who interacted with humans they had flying ships advanced technology why this this is not new to Satan he's been doing this ever since Genesis 6 He's done this before. So we see advanced technology and kingdom. So God wipes it all out and he does what? He replenishes. Look at Genesis chapter 9. Notice what God says to Noah. In verse 1, the Bible says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. And notice, replenish the earth. Let's finish it off with Jeremiah now. Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Oh, I'm, I'm about done. All right, let's wrap this up. Let's wrap this up. Jeremiah 31 verse 25. The final time God's going to replenish is going to be when he comes down on this earth and reigns for a thousand years. So he wipes out the Antichrist and his system and his kingdom and his 666, so to speak. So then God wipes it all out. They build it up. No surprise. Their advanced technology. We're already seeing some points, some pointers out right here where they're building it up. And Satan and the Antichrist is going to come down. But, you know, it's nothing new to God. God's like, look, I've seen you doing that at Genesis 6. And guess what? I'm going to wipe you all out. And then he, when he wipes them out, he tells them, the good guys, to replenish again during the 1,000-year millennium when he reigns as king. So look at the book of Genesis. Uh, not Genesis. Jeremiah 31, verse 25. For I have satiated the weary soul, and I have what? 
replenished every sorrowful soul. Notice right here that this replenishing ties to the nation of Israel uh, being restored again at verse 23. At verse 23, Israel is being restored. Verse 27, the house of Israel is being restored. So notice that in the passage that he restores the nation of Israel. So he's going to rule in the nation of Israel. And then the people are going to replenish once more and fill throughout the whole earth or refill more accurately. The Bible says in verse 23, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, As yet they shall use this speech in the land of Judah and in the cities thereof. When I shall bring again their captivity... The Lord bless thee, O habitation of justice and mountain of holiness. And there shall dwell in Judah itself and in all the cities thereof together, husbandmen and they that go forth with flocks. So notice he's, uh, re he's restoring the nation again. Verse 27, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. See that? He's refilling again. So he is refilling. Why? Because Satan promised... Oh, hey, let's do this. Let's do this. But guess what? Um, they already conditioned the people. The Antichrist already conditioned the people. Hey, this destructionary forces, it's going to be normal. All we have to do is we just have to conquer again. How can you call this your ideal kingdom? See, they're conditioning the people to have that. But that ain't your ideal kingdom. An ideal kingdom is no more suffering, no more pain, pure paradise. That's God's kingdom. But people don't want that. Isn't that amazing? The devil sure brainwashed them. Really, really good. And the devil is currently training you to be brainwashed and not look forward to God's kingdom and not want anything to do with God's kingdom, but just the current things of this world. You love this world too much, even in spite of so much destruction Nary force is happening today, but you could care less. Why? You've just been brainwashed already too much by what you've been fed by people, by somebody you look up to as your authorities. And that's what happened when you don't have the Word of God as your authority. And then corruption spreads. I hope that your eyes will be open and not be conditioned uh, by this wicked world. You can get saved right now. You know, you can get saved right now and then you don't have to uh, go through this awful timeline when it happens. Lord God Almighty, He can rapture us up to heaven and you can have, still have that chance and you can just jump to this kingdom when He comes down. And all you have to do is get saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. You might say, how do I get saved? All you have to do to get saved is A, B, and C. It's that simple. A, sin is a great offense to God. The punishment for sin is burning in hell forever. So let's be honest. You sinned before, I've sinned before. You might say, well, I don't want to burn in hell forever because of that. Then what do I do? That's why B, Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected. Now, you've heard that story a billion times, but you don't really know the meaning behind that story. Do you know why God even died to begin with? He had to do all that? Because remember, A, sin puts you in hell, right? The only thing that can wash away every sin you've done is the blood of Jesus. That's why Jesus died, buried, resurrected. So his blood can wash away every sin you've done. That means past, present, and future. That means no matter what sin you may commit later on in life, God can wipe it clean. Then you might say, wait, I thought that, uh, wait a minute, going to church then, cleaning up all my sins, being a good Christian, going to church, taking up my cross, following Jesus, getting baptized, uh, all those things then don't count for me to go to heaven. You're right. You should not trust in those things. You got to trust only what Jesus did on the cross. Otherwise, why did Jesus even die for you then? See, he died so you can trust in that alone, not anything you do. You might say, well, that's really easy then. Yeah, so C, we're at C. All you have to do is say that to God. It's that simple. Tell God, okay, God, all I'm counting on, all I'm believing in is what you did on the cross. I believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected to save me. If you say that to him, he'll save you. He'll save you. When you, have a re when you repent as a sinner and you go, I don't want to burn in hell for my sin. God, I repent. There's nothing you can do about it except just saying, God, I trust in you to take away my sin. I believe you died, buried, and resurrected to save me. Why not do it right now? You could do it right now. 
and then get saved and go to heaven. I could even help you out and give you the words if you want to get saved right now. And then uh, guess what? You're not going to, uh, you're going to have a great, what the Bible says, uh, the Bible doesn't call it a reset. The Bible don't call it replenish. He calls it, uh, uh, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He calls it new. And then he calls it a new thing for you. So you can have that today. Uh, it's not a great reset. It's not a great replenish. It's something new for you. And you can start the beginning of a new life. I mean, don't want to miss out that chance. It's so easy to do it. I'll help you say the words to God. You can just repeat after me. So you can say it this way. Just bow your head, close your eyes, and then you can say it this way. Dear God, I repent as a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so His blood can wash away my sin. I only trust in that alone and not my good works and not in anything I do. Only you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.